between the five or six that Cascade Area Right to Life booked for him. Thank you, Cascade. And he even added one on his own. Now that's a speaker for Dubuque County Right to Life. <laughs> he has a grueling schedule for tomorrow. It's the last day of his month-long adventure. He's going to speak at Wallet one class after another. <laughs> So we're very excited about that one. But Deacon Bill, among a gazillion other accomplishments, is a graduate of Loris College. He earned his master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan. He spent 40 years as a licensed professional engineer and has been awarded three U.S. patents. Deacon Bill was ordained to the permanent diaconate in the Archdiocese of Dubuque in 1986. He has been active in many, many special areas of service, including healing, evangelization, and the jail and prison ministry. He has a depth of spiritual insight into how we can respect life in all its stages. Deacon Bill is married to Sue. They have seven children and 12 grandchildren. Please help me welcome Deacon Bill Beaver. ago, Jesus shared the parable of the wedding banquet. Remember the man who got kicked out of the banquet? It's because he was not wearing a wedding garment, right? He wasn't ejected because he was the biggest sinner that was present. It's because he refused to put on the garment that the host of a Jewish wedding feast customarily provided for each and every one of the guests. It was a gift that the host would provide. And that person represents anyone who thinks that they're good enough to enter heaven without Jesus, the only Savior our Heavenly Father has provided to cover the sinfulness of each and every one of us. Those to whom Jesus was addressing the story knew that Jesus was confronting their self-righteousness, so as a result of hearing it, what did they do? They went off plotting to kill him. If you stop and think about it, self-righteousness can easily lead us to forget that many, if not most people, who we call pro-choice, are people who are baptized. And that makes them just as much a son or a daughter of God as people who take a stand for the sanctity of human life from the point of conception to natural death. Are we called to challenge their choice? Most definitely. But it must be done with love and not hatred or judgment in our hearts. In a sense, those not yet respecting life are like unborn spiritual fetuses in the womb of the church, in my mind. And we cannot abandon or condemn them just because they do not yet agree with what we know is certain and true about the sacredness of all human life. We must remember, Jesus died for us all, and he died for us all while we were all still sinners. In the context of this Respect Life Month of October, it can be an easy temptation for us to continue dividing people into those we call pro-life and those we call pro-choice. And we can easily view the one as being on God's side and the other as being on the side of the evil one. Such a black and white separation, however, is not necessarily a spiritually healthy one. The reason I say that is because those who identify themselves for the life of the unborn in the womb often fail to respect the intrinsic dignity of those who support choice, just as much as those who support choice disrespect the life of the unborn in the womb. Hopefully, we have eyes to see where it is that we may have fallen short. And hopefully we can see that those for choice have been blinded by the deception of the devil who has convinced them that the evil that they choose is good. They believe, for example, that it's good to save a pregnant teen from her desperation. 
They believe it is good not to bring a child with a defect into the world. Planned Parenthood believes that it's a good thing to offer their services to the community. A doctor who euthanizes believes it's a good thing to peacefully end the life of someone who wants to die. Some states still think it's a good thing to end a convict's life by means of capital punishment. Satan has so blinded them to the sin associated with the prevailing culture of death that it doesn't matter in so many cases what we say or what we do that will persuade them to look upon the intrinsic value of human life any differently. Now, there's no doubt that legislative efforts, picketing, marching, or standing in a chain for life can have a much needed effect in bringing the evil of choice to the attention of society. And I affirm each and every one of you for whatever effort you have provided, provided in that respect. But if we look at the number of children saved by these means compared to the numbers that have died since Roe versus Wade, it suggests, at least in my mind, we need to be looking for a much more powerful and sustained approach to fully turn the tide to respect for life. The good news is that Jesus has given us four very, very powerful spiritual weapons with which we can conquer evil with good in the war for life. These weapons are not for defending life, they are weapons with which we need to attack the evil spirits against whom we're fighting. Yes, it's true. St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Ephesians, our battle is not against human forces, but against the principalities and the powers, the rulers of this world of darkness, the evil spirits in regions above. The first of these weapons is love. In Matthew's Gospel, near the end of his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his followers, you have heard the commandment, you shall love your countrymen, but hate your enemies. My command to you is, love your enemies, pray for your persecutors. In Luke's gospel, he says it this way, to you who hear me, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who maltreat you. The second weapon is communal prayer. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus assures us, again I tell you, if just two of you join your voices on earth for anything whatever, it will be granted you by my Father in heaven. The third and the fourth weapons are found in the power of faith and fasting. Remember how Jesus' disciples asked him why they could not expel the demon from the boy who was possessed by that evil spirit, he tells them, because you have so little trust. I assure you, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you would be able to say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible for you. This kind does not leave but by prayer and fasting. So will these weapons really work? Can we really win over an opponent through the use of good? I was glad to see that all of you didn't hear me on the radio yesterday. <laughs> that means I can tell my story all over. <laughs> April 23rd, the year 2002, 12.55 p.m. I had just returned from noon mass and I was eating my lunch at work at Mercy Medical Center, where I served most recently as the Director of Clinical Engineering. And I got a phone call from my son, Matt, and I could tell that Matt was just extremely troubled, and he was struggling to get out the words, Dad, Jeff, his older brother, one of my other sons, died this morning. I said, Matt, what did you say? He said, Dad, Jeff died this morning. I said, Matt, what happened? He said, I don't know, but they took his body to the Cook County morgue, and they pronounced him dead on arrival. Matt didn't know what had happened. And so we hung up. I was in shock. I was in tears. I went home. I met Sue, my wife, in the driveway. She was in shock. She was in tears. And the two of us got in the car, <clears throat> and we be began the long trip to Chicago to arrive there in the afternoon just to meet the rush hour traffic. It took us several more hours to get to the Cook County morgue where Jeff's body was at. 
We walked in an outer door into a vestibule, and the inner door was locked, and there was no one around whatsoever. I happened to see a button on the wall, so I pressed it, and a voice said, can I help you? I said, yes, we're the Beavers. We've come from Dubuque, and we're here. We'd like to spend a few moments with our son. The lady was very, very quick to say, well, I'm sorry, sir, but it's after hours. Your son's body has already been identified. There's no need for you to come in. What was that? There's no need for us to come in? I said, ma'am, this is our son. I said, we don't even know why he passed away. Certainly, you can give us a couple minutes, whether it's after hours or not. And she said, no, it's against our policy. And she hung up the intercom. Matt, young guy that he was, ready to kick down the door. Sue was in tears once again, and I just kind of slumped against the wall. But by the grace of the Holy Spirit, I was moved to pray. I said, Jesus, you said that if we had faith the size of a mustard seed, we could move mountains. I said, I've got a mountain of a locked door right here, and I could use you to move it right now. The instant I ended that prayer, a man just happened to be walking down the hall, he opened the door, and he said, are you here to identify a body? Now, I'm striving to be a good, honest Christian man, and I'm ordained to be a holy deacon to give example to other people. But I have to confess, I was willing to give myself the benefit of the doubt as to what it means to identify a body, <laughs> since I've never been in this situation before in my life. So I said yes. The three of us walked in, and guess who we meet? The lady on the other end. She said, I have already told you, it is after hours. Your son's body has been identified. You are not going to come in. There we stand. I'm sort of feeling like I've got an opponent, an enemy, standing here before me. And by the grace of the Holy Spirit, I'm moved to pray. Lord, what do you want me to do? As clear as day, the message comes. Look upon her with love. So I dropped my hands. I tried to open my eyes, hoping that the light of the Lord was coming through my eyes. I wasn't really feeling any too much love for this lady. <laughs> and she ran off like a scared rabbit into the next room. I don't think she'd ever been loved like that before. <laughs> her supervisor came out. I'm sure he heard what was going on. And I could tell he was going to try to put some real smooth diplomatic closure to what he heard from the next room. And so he says to me, you know, sir, I am really so sorry. But the fact of the matter is, it is after hours, and your son's body has been identified. And as much as I'd like to let you come in, I just can't. I pleaded with the man. I said, sir, you put yourself in our shoes. Your son has just died. I'm standing in your shoes, and you don't know why your son has died, and you're asking me to make a little two to three minute exception so you can say a prayer with your son. I said, wouldn't you want me to let you come in? He said, yes, I'm sure I would, but I still can't let you in. I'm feeling like I got another opponent standing here before me, another enemy. And I didn't feel any love for this guy. But I was moved by the grace of the Spirit to pray once again. Lord, now what do you want me to do? Clear as day. Look upon him with love. And so I began to look upon him with love, wondering if, am I going to be arrested for looking upon this guy with love? <laughs> Here I am standing in a government facility, and he could easily pick up the phone and have me charged with trespassing. But I decided, the Lord told me to look upon him with love. I haven't heard anything different, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look upon him with love. And so there we stood there, eyeball to eyeball, 15, 20 seconds, which seemed like kind of an eternity. And then he said to me, unless you insist. And as politely, and as courteously, and as respectfully as I could, I said, sir, I do insist. I looked up at the clock, but then it was two minutes to seven, and I turned to Sue, and I said, Sue, just look at, at seven o'clock, these two people who have been a little bit cold and 
insensitive to what we're going through, we're going to open that door and they're going to take us to go see Jeff. Now she had been crying almost this entire time and so she had tears in her eyes and looked at me rather puzzled and said, how in the world do you know that? I said, I know that because our community, our Christian community back at St. Paul Hills told us that they're going to gather together at 7 o'clock in prayer for us. And I said, when they gather in the name and in the power of Jesus, those doors are going to open. Well, the good news is, as the second hand passed the seventh hour, the doors opened, and these two people who had been our opponents, in a sense our enemies, took the initiative to set up a television camera, hook it up to a TV set, and we were able to stand before Jeff and pray a little prayer together. Lord Jesus, would you please see to it that Jeff is resurrected from the dead. Now Jeff did not get up off the table as we had hoped. He died at age 27 of complications from diabetes. What's my point in this story? The four weapons, love, look upon them with love. Communal prayer, our parish community, trust. Jesus, if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains and the door open. And you might wonder, well, you haven't mentioned any fasting. Well, it just so happens that 10 days prior to this episode, I had been fasting for 32 straight days. The first 10 days of which were on water and the body and the blood of Christ, and the next 22 on only liquids. And so my soul was prepared to meet this antagonistic situation, just like Jesus was able to do when he so easily drove the demon out of that boy with a word of command. You know, no matter what evil someone has done or what they're doing, we must be willing to remember that Jesus loves them and has died for them, that they might receive his gifts of mercy, forgiveness, healing, and salvation. I met one of those men back a number of years ago down at the Dubuque County Jail when I was engaged in my jail and prison ministry. His name happened to be Gene. I recognized him because his face had been splashed all over the newspapers the week before. He had committed a serious crime against a little six or seven year old kindergarten girl up at a school on the north end of Dubuque. And here he was being held before he went to court. Now my job on a Sunday night is to conduct an ecumenical prayer service for anyone and everyone who shows up. But because of the nature of his crime, this guy was segregated. So I was sitting before him with the visiting room glass between us, and never once did he lift his head to make eye contact with me. I began my routine prayer service, and as I got a few sentences into it, something within me, the Holy Spirit, spoke and said, Bill, this isn't what this man needs right now. I said, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? And a message came to my head, asked him if he's seen his mother lately. Now, I got a lot of humanness still in me, so I kind of responded, Lord, why in the world would you want me to ask him if he's seen his mother lately? And the Holy Spirit said, never mind why I'm asking you to ask him if he's seen his mother lately. Just ask him if he's seen his mother lately. And so I called him by name. I said, Gene, at which point he raised his head and made eye contact with me for the first time. I said, have you seen your mother lately? And this man instantaneously broke down in tears and he struggled to get out the words, my mother has refused to speak to me for the past 15 years. And as he spoke those words, his face just looked so full of misery and anguish. I don't think I've ever seen a more, uh, a more, fear-stricken person in my entire life, or anguish-stricken person. And as I saw that extreme anguish on his face, it's as if just for an instant, 
The Lord gave me the grace to look right into the center of this man's soul. And what did I see but Jesus himself hanging on the cross, bloody, beaten, spit, up, spit upon, <clears throat> crowned with thorns, and in absolute anguish. And why was he there? He was there suffering for the soul of this man whom society would say has committed a crime that is unforgivable. But in the eyes of Jesus, he was not. I prayed a prayer then, or I asked him, I said, you know, sir, it must have been extremely painful for you to be rejected by your mother the way that you were for these past 15 years. Do you think it would be a good idea if we pray together right now and ask Jesus to give you the grace to forgive your mother so that you can be at peace, so that you can be healed of that hurt that you've experienced? And while we're at it, what do you think if we pray that you can forgive yourself for anything and everything that you may have ever done that you may not be very proud of? The man humbly, humbly shook his head, yes. I put my hands to the visiting room glass, and I just said, Jesus, would you please see to it that my friend here receives the grace to forgive his mother and to forgive himself. I have to trust that the prayer was answered. He left the room. I've never seen him again. He's probably spending a long, long time in some security prison somewhere in the country. But as he left that room, I believe the Holy Spirit said to me, Bill, this is what it means when Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it for me. Just as he cared for this man, Jesus cares just as much for the blind soul of every abortionist, every euthanizer, every proponent of capital punishment, and every person who thinks they see a choice in the words, thou shalt not kill. Yes, doesn't it seem to you, as it seems to me, that you have to be blind if you cannot see that respecting life throughout all ages is a command and not an option? Fortunately, nothing is impossible for God when it comes restoring sight to the blind. Last August, it was a Thursday afternoon, about two in the afternoon. I got a call from Gisela, who was the Hispanic coordinator at St. Pat's Church in downtown Dubuque. Gisela said, Deacon Bill, I got your name from Tracy Morrison, the executive director of Catholic Charities. She said, maybe you could help me. I said, Gisela, what is it you're looking for? She said, well, I've got a Hispanic lady in downtown Dubuque, and she has two detached retinas. And she needs surgery in Iowa City this coming Monday, or she's going to go absolutely blind. She said, the only problem is, we need $14,000 by tomorrow, or Iowa City is going to cancel the surgery. Now, I've learned that we shouldn't make any quick decisions if we're trying to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the leading of the Spirit. So I didn't say no, but I was thinking, you know, I don't have $14,000 sitting around, and I don't think I can get enough people together to come up with $14,000 by tomorrow. <coughs> and so I prayed that prayer that you can see is kind of something I resort to when I don't know what else to say. Lord, is there something you want me to do here? And this mental vision comes to me, it's me sitting down, pulling out my home equity loan checkbook and writing out a check for $14,000. I said, Lord, don't you think I better talk to my wife before I do something like this? I didn't hear anything, but I think he said yes. <laughs> Sue came into my office just a short while later, and I told her what I just shared with you, and without one moment's hesitation, she said yes. I think we're called to do that. And so the next day, we wrote out a check for $14,000 with the idea we would trust the generous people in the Christian community around Dubuque to help us with this, maybe so that we could recoup most of it. At the same time, I sent out two emails, a 
okay? I don't know, there might have been 25 names on each one. But I sent them to people that I thought were generous, and I said, would you please consider helping us with this? I told them what we had done. And if you can't help, would you at least pass this on to someone else? Well, the good news is, within about one week, the entire $14,000 had come back. And the lady had her surgery on Monday. But the problem was, the money kept coming in. <laughs> and it kept coming in. It was coming from everywhere. It was coming from the convents. It was coming from the parishes that I never, uh, people I never even sent the thing to. It was coming from everywhere. It was even coming from up in Wisconsin, in Stoughton, Wisconsin. And so now Sue and I are getting kind of panic stricken. Lord, what do you want us to do with all this money? When I get another phone call from Giselle, Bill, I got bad news. The lady's surgery failed. She needs to have a second surgery. Well, the doctor, finding out where the money had come from to begin with, offered his services for nothing for the second surgery, and we had enough money already collected that we paid for the surgical suite for the second one. And we thought, all right, all said and good. Thank you, Lord. But the money kept rolling in, and it kept rolling in. And by the time all was said and done, we had collected over $40,000, just as a result of those two emails. And now we're praying again. Lord, what do you want us to do with all this money? Well, I started thinking, well, we got all this extra money. This was for a blind lady. I started looking into an organization that said that they could do a $300 cataract surgery and restore sight to people with this, whatever condition they had. I thought we might be able to see the Lord heal hundreds of people and restore their blindness. And I was looking into that when I get another call from Gisela. This time she's down in the airport in Miami, Florida, and she said, Deacon Bill, my grandfather in Peru has died. I'm on my way down to Peru to go to the funeral. She says, we got another problem. The lady's second surgery has failed. We need another surgery at a cost of $25,000. Well, I think you can see the good news. It was paid in full. We already had the money, and we paid the cost of that third surgery in full. What's my point in this? Just as Jesus moved his body here on earth to heal this lady's physical blindness, how much more does he desire for his body to heal the spiritual blindness and save the souls of those so in need of the mercy and forgiveness that's only available when we put on Christ? So Lord, what do you want us to do? I think he would tell us today that first, we need to realize we're not fighting against people, but against the powers of darkness. This is spiritual warfare. As such, the battle for life is never going to be won completely through legislative, political, courtroom, or other merely temporal efforts. Are they worthwhile? Most certainly. But total dependence on them is failing to employ the power and the authority that we have as the body of Christ. Second, we need to quit viewing ourselves as only defending life and start attacking the powers of evil that are trying to destroy life. With the full force of these spiritual weapons of love, prayer, fasting, and trust. Jesus fearlessly and he offensively commanded evil spirits to leave. With confidence, he employed his full authority in heaven and on earth, and we, as his body here on earth, must do the same. If we are fearful, we must open wide the doors of our hearts to God's love, the St. John tells us, as the power to drive out all fear. And we must look upon our, upon our opponents with love. In a sense, once we've received that love, we need to give as a gift the gift that we have received. 
Love, as we all know, is the greatest of all the spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit. If it's the greatest, that means it's the best gift that we have to conquer the evil that we are called to detest with good. Next, we must pray in agreement as fervently for the souls of those who oppose the sacredness of human life as we've been praying for the life of the unborn to be protected against the evil of abortion. We must be a united voice before God for both the unborn and the spiritually unborn. Notice I say praying in agreement. That's very important. And that was taught to me by another prisoner down at the Dubuque County Jail. Her name happened to be, I'm going to call her Joanna, for the sake of confidentiality. Joanna came into the jail one night and she said, Deacon Bill, Jesus said that if two people pray in agreement for anything whatever, it would be granted by our Father in heaven, right? I said, yes, Joanna, he did say that. She said, then I want you to pray in agreement with me right now that my 50-year prison sentence will be suspended. <laughs> I turned my head like this and I said, Lord, you know I don't have that much faith. But I added, if you'll give me faith the size of a mustard seed right now, that kind of faith that really pleases our Heavenly Father, even though I don't feel very confident, I'll turn back to Joanna and I'll pray with her. And so I turned back and not feeling any more confident than I did at the start, I put my hands to the glass and I said, Lord Jesus, please see to it that Joanna's 50 year prison sentence will be suspended. And one week later, it was. Praying in agreement in the name and in the power of Jesus. You know, we hear often, we need to pray, pray, pray. But isn't it the truth that sometimes we just take that as kind of a generic antidote that really doesn't have a whole lot of power, and what people really want is our money, but they tell us to pray first anyway? There's power in prayer. There's so much power in prayer that money doesn't, it's nothing compared to the power that we have when we pray in agreement in the name of Jesus. And that's the weapon that we need to start employing. We need to expectantly believe that when we pray in agreement, our prayer will be answered. Why? Because Jesus told us that it would, and for no other reason. Our prayer must be in reparation for the sins those who support choice are committing against the sanctity of human life and also in reparation for the sins that we who say we support life are committing by what we fail to do for our brothers and sisters whose blindness prevents them from seeing that they have been lied to by Satan and his legions of fallen angels. I believe that our fasting must continue beyond these 40 days for life, realizing that it's only by prayer and fasting that spirits like pride and stubbornness can be driven out. We must be willing to enter the realm of the Spirit by docilely surrendering to the leading of the Holy Spirit, whom we call what? The Lord and the giver of life. Ready to ask the Holy Spirit what He wants us to personally do, and ready to be obedient to what we're asked to do. Yes, this takes some faith, and maybe we think we don't have that much faith. But it only takes faith the size of a mustard seed, a gift for which we can ask the Lord, and He will give it to us most readily. Finally, I believe we must trust that God wants to open the eyes of those called pro-choice as much, if not more, than we desire to save the unborn. For if they could see their choice was evil in God's eyes, they would change their choice to what God shows them is good. The good news is that Jesus has already paid the price of their sight. He's asking us to share in the victory of conquering the evil of their blindness with good, not with money, but with unconditional love. Unceasing prayer for them, 
and respect for their intrinsic goodness even before they're able to see. The question becomes, how much respect in advance are we willing to pay forward to our brothers and sisters who are not yet willing to respect the sanctity of life from the point of conception to natural death? Are we willing to follow in Jesus' footsteps and die to ourselves in efforts to bring new life to sinners while they are still sinners? Are we willing to choose to believe that Jesus had the pro-choice sinner in mind when he said, whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it for me? I think we can and we will. If we were not committed to move forward, we would not be here today. But we can and we will. Not by our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that has drawn us to this banquet as the invitation that it is from our Heavenly Father. But if we want, if we want to remain with Him, we need to put on the wedding garment, Christ Himself. Once again, whether it be the first time or the hundred and first time, to cover our own sinfulness. Without Jesus, we can do nothing but through Him, with Him, and in Him, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask for or imagine. So now that our meal has ended, and we're ready to go forth clothed in Christ alone, I say to you, go, and generously give as a gift the gift of respect for life that you have received. And as you do so, whether it be with your friend or with your foe, believe with all expectancy that God will give them the grace to give as a gift the respect for life they have received as a gift from Him through us. May Almighty God bless all of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.